Panama. Finally, after almost 40 years, I revisited the land where some of my youth was spent while serving in the Army in the 1970s. Since then, things have changed tremendously. During my two years here in the mid-1970s, the country was ruled by Omar Torrijos, who mysteriously died in a plane crash in the early 80s, and the country was taken over by dictator Manuel Noriega. After U.S. military intervention, the country changed toward democracy and enjoyed economical growth. In fact, one of the best economies in all Latin America. My journey is a place known as Boquete, or Valley of the Flowers, a town in the highlands of the Cherokee Providence, about 20 miles from the Costa Rican border. Boquete is a town that is inhabited by many expats, mostly U.S. and Canadians. The attraction here is the cool climate, which stems from 70 to 80 degrees all year long, not to mention the low cost of living and natural foods. Along with the international crowd, one finds a mixture of Indians known as the Gobi, and also Panamanians, and of course, the Gringos. Upon my arrival to the Valley of Flowers, I was greeted with all the shops closed. It's Mother's Day, a holiday that Panamanians take seriously. So exploring on my own, I decided to check out the landscape. Here I wandered to the Central Park, an area shared as a place to sit and relax or wait for a bus. As everything was closed, I did find a nice cozy spot called Mike's where expats hang out and enjoy a mixture of international cuisine and cold adult beverages. Early Tuesday morning, I found myself crossing the bridge to attend the weekly gringo market. Here anything organic is a big item on the hit list, along with baked goods, other wares, and even a chiropractor will give you an adjustment. And if you're stressed out, you can even get a massage. Afterwards, breakfast at the Central Park Cafe, consisting of beefsteak, two eggs, a corn tortilla, fresh bread, and the best juice I've ever tasted, and of course, coffee, all for the price of just about $6. Summoning my friend Charlie, an American expat, we were off the trek to the highlands. Here I had a chance to visit the coffee plantations, high mountain cliffs, and even the waterfalls. Many nature lovers come to this place to view the beauty of the mountains, the waterfalls, see the clouds hover over the mountains, and climb the dormant volcano known as Volcan Baru. At an elevation of 11,398 feet, it is said that on a clear day, you can see both the Atlantic and Pacific Ocean from the top. But clear days isn't something Boquete sees very often. It's always rainy here, mostly from the drizzle of low-flying clouds. But, as fortune has it, during one of my jungle treks, I became witness to a remarkable rainbow with the Vulcan Baru in the background, which is a normal occurrence in this area. Further down the road, we came upon the abandoned castle of Boquete. Built 40 years ago, the landowner died of a sudden heart attack during the construction, and the castle was never completed, nor inhabited. Well, perhaps today by squatters. Calling it a day, we ended up again at Mike's. We indulge in adult beverages, as many expats do, and just talking the night away. Here, no worries about American politics, Al-Qaeda, Obama, or ISIS. Just plain conversation of just about anything else. Here, everyone displays the manana attitude, or why should I do it now when I can do it tomorrow? Retiring for the night, I returned to my casita for a good night's slumber. But a surprise awakened me at 4.30 in the morning as my bed was rocked back and forth by an earthquake tremor measuring 6.6 .6 on the Richter scale, the second in three days. Seated on the Continental Divide, earthquake tremors here are a common occurrence. The next morning, I ventured up the streets of Baquete and noticed that ecotourism, coffee plantation tours, horseback riding and jungle zip lines are a big industry here, mostly sold by gringo expats. Want to learn Spanish? They have a school for that too. Don't be intimidated by local police riding around on motorcycles and carrying automatic weapons. Their role is simply to keep the peace. We even have a fire department of Boquete and a medical clinic in case someone is injured or just needs regular medical help. After a day of hiking, I found myself headed back to Mike's to enjoy a nice bowl of chili and a cold Panamanian beer. 
The next morning, I was collected by my friend Baba, another American expat who was born and raised in the former Canal Zone, and after a career in the military, retired here with his wife and his dog Buddy. Exploring the regions of Okan, we stopped to visit the top of a waterfalls racing over a deep canyon, another beautiful wonder of the Panamanian landscape. Careful not to fall over, these drops are deep and the rocks are slippery. But as Bubba told me not to worry, he would be happy to escort my body home in case I did fall. After a day of roaming, we stopped at a local restaurant and enjoyed a treat I haven't had for many years. Ceviche, raw fish marinated in herbs and spices that leave a desire for more. This is the best place in Boquete to get it, as I am told, and you'll find no argument here. As darkness came, saying goodbye to my friend Baba, well, you know the rest. I could easily become an alcoholic here, but as I learned, there isn't much to do. Boquete is a lovely place to visit, but it has its issues. Water is a big deal here, and before visiting, make sure the place you're staying at has hot water. After saying goodbye to Boquete, I boarded my plane in the city of David and headed for Panama City. After about a 30 or 40 minute flight, we crossed the Bridge of the Americas, the Pacific entrance to the Panama Canal, before touching down on terra firma. Here I landed at Albrook Airport, an old American air base now under Panamanian control. Outside my hotel room, I could see Ancon Hill, where once the American flag flew until the peanut farmer gave it all back to the Panamanians in the year 2000. This 654 foot hill stood overlooking the entrance of the Panama Canal and the outskirts of Panama City. Now seeing the flag of Panama flying, it states the sovereignty of the Panamanian people and a government free of American influence. Adjacent to the entrance of my hotel, a huge mall dominated the entire area, and I mean huge. Almost anything you want is here, including American food chains and good American style prices for all the goods. But as I wandered about, I hear American seasonal music. It's Christmas time, and the entire population of Panama City seems to have congregated here to do their shopping. <music> The next morning, after hiring a driver, I requested a trip to Casco Viejo, translated as the Old Quarter. Settled in 1673, it was built after the near destruction of Old Panama, the original Panama City, raided by the pirate Henry Morgan. The prize he was after sits on the outer regions of the area, the Church of the Golden Altar. In the Iglesia de San Jose, a wooden altar covered with gold was part of the original church of Old Panama. When pirate Henry Morgan attacked the city, the Jesuits painted the altar black to hide the gold. The pirates left it alone, thinking it was worthless. After Morgan sacked and burned the old Panama, the Jesuit monks of the Order of St. Augustine moved the altar to the new church and its present location, taking off the black paint. Casco Viejo is a mixture of the old and new. Here you see old buildings getting a new life as the area is dominated by skyscrapers of Panama City across the channel. Coffee houses, restaurants, and old Spanish style architecture with a mixture of local tourists flooding the streets. At the town square, a commotion is noticed as dozens of San Blas Indian women are congregating about. A local group, probably a religious group, is handing out clothing to the Indians in what must be a gesture of the season. The San Blas or Kuna Indians are one of about six indigenous tribes of Panama. Known for the colorful hand-stitched cloths known as molas, the Kunas live in old traditional ways on an island called San Blas and make their money mostly by the tourist trade. And they really don't like to have their photos taken unless you pay them, and if you don't, they'll turn away. 
After spending the day in Casco Viejo, I decided it was time to beat it back to my hotel before the approaching rain ruins my day. No mics here to keep me entertained, so back again to the mall to find some Christmas bargains. The next morning, my driver picks me up as my time is limited. I go home today. He takes me to see the sights I remember from my ill-begotten youth. As we're traveling along, a Chiva bus, known as the Red Devil, passes us along the way as we approach the old Panama Canal Administration Building. On this journey, I once again see the Bridge of the Americas, only this time at ground level. Many times as a young soldier, I have crossed this bridge to visit the former Canal Zone and Panama City. After a brief jaunt further across the bridge, we came to the former Howard Air Force Base, now a developed area known as Panama Pacifico. Commercial buildings and condos now dot the landscape as many old military buildings are no longer standing. Here I spent the last six months of my deployment in the Army after an 18-month stint on the Atlantic side of the canal. On approach to the area, once known as Fort Kobe, I find that my old barracks is now in ruin and some of the buildings of the former command are being torn down. As I venture inside, the voices of the past echo in my head. Traveling further down the road, I found the old ammo bunker was just as we left it, and the beaches that we used to frequent are now a high-end resort hotel guarded by a security fence with no access for an old soldier taking a trip down the memory lane. After seeing the old-style Spanish domes on the road, I remember flying over this area on approach to Albrook. With a few hours to spare, we end up at the former Fort Clayton, which was a major army base during the days of the Canal Zone. I was happy to see that they kept it up and that the U.S. Embassy now resides in this area. Most of the housing here are high-end and former military structures have been converted to beautiful homes, most likely for embassy personnel. Across the way, a ship transiting the canal on its last leg of the journey goes through the Mir Flores Locks. A new canal museum appeases tourists by the busload for a charge of $15 admission, but my time is running out and I must return to catch my plane. The new Panama has a lot to offer for those who visit. I caution against going anywhere alone, and especially at nighttime, and always bargain for your goods and especially taxi rides. In the tourist areas such as Casco Viejo, they'll try to play Gringo Bingo, gouging the prices, but should you not be able to negotiate a price, simply walk down a few blocks to the non-tourist area and catch a ride for a quarter of the price. As my journey ends, I, for the last time, drive through downtown Panama City, remembering what it was like then and how it is modernized now, and check this trip off my bucket list. <laughs>